Hey everyone, Pastor Kevin Rollins here from Providence Friends. Sorry I'm getting to you a little later uh, than normal, but uh, God had a little change of plans on me this morning and uh, he wanted me to bring you a different message than uh, what I had previously planned on doing. And so I wanna be obedient to him this morning and uh, let his word uh, speak and uh, hopefully I'll get out of the way and, and let him uh, speak to whoever this message is for this morning. It might be for all of us, who knows? Uh, but anyway, I want to jump right into the Word this morning. So if you have your Bible, uh, turn with me to Genesis chapter 47. And we're going to look at verses 5 and 6 here and uh, just set a little context about what's happening. Um, while you're turning there, uh, Joseph, uh, we know uh, uh, Jacob's uh, one of Jacob's sons, and we know that through uh, a myriad of different circumstances, uh, we know that uh, Joseph was allowed to uh, be used in a powerful way, uh, even though there were some uh, circumstances set against him that, uh, that were not very good. And we know that God used them because Joseph remained faithful through all of these bad circumstances. And at the time this happens here in Genesis 47, uh, Joseph is a second only under Pharaoh himself. And uh, he has uh, pretty much, he's got control of the land here. Uh, Pharaoh uh, looks at him and, and uh, allows him to be able to, to do different things. And so uh, Jake, uh, Jacob and his family have, have come down. Joseph has revealed himself to them. And so they come before Pharaoh uh, and, and ask to, to dwell in the land. Uh, and they were, at the time, they were dwelling in the land of Goshen. And so Joseph uh, speaks with Pharaoh as well as Jacob and a few others. And uh, that's where we pick up here in Genesis chapter 47, verses 5 and 6. And it says, Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Your father and your brothers have come to you. The land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best of the land. Let them settle in the land of Goshen. And if you know any able men among them, put them in charge of my livestock. So a famine had led his family down there. Joseph revealed himself to them. And after all of the different circumstances that, had, uh, that caused all of this to happen, uh, God had used it for good and, and put Joseph where he needed him to be. And so... Uh, God had already put something in place where uh, Jacob and uh, his, his family could be provided for. And at this point, we know that God was in the center of their story. Uh, the, the people there were, were doing quite well. We know that as we continue uh, to read on, we know that they, they settled there in the land. And Goshen, you know, typically when we think of Egypt, we think of, uh, we think of where the pyramids are, it's desert, things like that. Uh, but here the, the word tells us that this was the best land in Egypt. Uh, the land of Goshen is probably some of the most fertile land uh, anywhere in that area and, and maybe even in some parts of the entire world. So Pharaoh gave to Joseph's family um, this very fertile land. And so uh, at this point, God was in the center of their story because we know uh, through... Uh, reading the word that Joseph was faithful. We know that Jacob was faithful. And yeah, some of his sons were uh, faithful as well. But uh, we do know that Jacob and Joseph were faithful uh, to the Lord. And so God was blessing them. God was the center of their story. And God blessed them. We know that uh, God continued to bless them because they began to multiply. And, and not only did they multiply there in Goshen, uh, in this land, but they also began to multiply throughout the entire land of Egypt. And so God was prospering the, uh, the Israelites all throughout the land of Egypt. Now we, we get to a point where Joseph dies and uh, that generation who knew Joseph, that generation that was with Joseph, we know that he, they all passed away. And this is where some things changed because there was a transition that took place. And, and this, is, this is where the transition I think is important to the rest of this story 
as far as uh, how God was looking at this and as far as how the, the people were looking at this, there was a perspective that had changed. There was a transition that took place. And sometimes I think we're the same way. Sometimes I think we find ourselves in the exact same kind of spot that the Israelites found themselves in. And so what I mean by that is when we look ahead into Exodus, which is not far from where we were reading in Exodus chapter 1, it tells us that something happened. Uh, we know that, uh, as I just said, Joseph uh, had passed away uh, and uh, his, uh, his generation had passed away. And it said that in Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, it gives us the context of what happens uh, in this time of transition. It said, Now there arose a new king over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with heavy burdens. They built for Pharaoh store cities, Pithom and Ramses. Now while Joseph was in charge, and that one particular Pharaoh was in charge, God was the center of the story. But there was a transition that took place over the time that Joseph had died and his his family, that generation had died to when uh, this new king, this new Pharaoh took over. And this new, uh, new king and new Pharaoh uh, began to uh, oppress the Israelite people out of fear. Now, by and large, you know, as far as we can tell, the Israelite people uh, were, you know, helping out the Egyptians. Uh, archaeologically, we know that uh, the uh, Israelite people uh, actually uh, actually kind of worked hand in hand with the Egyptians there for a while. That was during this transition period. But something happened. Uh, th th there, there began to be this uh, transition from uh, being able to get along with each other, being able to work together to all of a sudden now the Israelites were being oppressed. And so I think when we get to this point, I, th I think there's a valuable lesson that we can learn from this, and we have to look a little bit further. So if you would, turn with me to uh, just flip over to Exodus chapter 2. Because this gives us uh, and this gives us some details. We know the events that took place. We know that uh, uh, after uh, Pharaoh had uh, charged uh, his taskmasters to go in and uh, really oppress the people of Israel. We know that uh, while this is going on, we, we read about Moses being born. We read about the midwives uh, not listening to Pharaoh and not uh, killing the male children. Uh, but we do know that there was a lot of, uh, uh, there was a very murderous intent uh, on the uh, part of the Israelite people. Pharaoh issued an order throughout uh, all of his people that uh, any son that was born was to be thrown into the Nile. And so uh, God blessed those who wouldn't uh, listen to that decree. Uh, but it got to a point where uh, the people were crying out. Uh, there was a, uh, a transition was taking place and, and God's blessings were fading. Uh, they, they weren't, uh, the, the people of Israel were not being uh, blessed by God like they were before under Joseph. Now remember again, I just I want to reiterate this, is that God was the center of their story. And when, you, when, when we look at Joseph and Jacob and his family, God was the center of the story. Uh, especially with Joseph. Joseph got where he's at because he trusted in God. He had faith in God. So God was the center of the story. God was the center of Joseph's life. I think as people, as Christians, that's important to remember. So as we look at this, as this transition is taking place, amongst the Israelite and the, and the Egyptian people, blessings start fading. There's more oppression and less blessing. And so let's look and see what perhaps may have happened here. Uh, in, in Exodus chapter 2, uh, after all the uh, oppression begins and it gets worse and worse and, and, and the bondage is getting really uh, hard and burdensome on the Israelite people, 
uh, in, in Exodus chapter 2 says this, uh, starting with verse uh, 23. It says, During those many days the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery, and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. Now, notice something interesting here. When he says, and when it's recorded, it says that they cried out. It, it doesn't say that they cried out to God. It just says that they cried out. So it, there's a question there, exactly who were they crying out to? Uh, they were they were severely oppressed, severely burdened. What was happening? What what was going on during this transition period that that where they cried out? Why does it not say specifically? Why did they not cry out to God? Is it perhaps that God was no longer the center of their story? Had something else got in the way of their story? Had something blocked their blessings? And I believe, I believe it, it, that's what it was. Because the Word of God tells us that that's what it was. And so I, I, want, you, I want you to think about this as they're going through this process, through this transition period, through this period of being blessed to oppressed and crying out for help. The fact that they didn't specifically cry out to God Perhaps they were crying out somewhere else. You know, we tend to do that sometimes. We tend to cry out in places that uh, where God is not in that cry. We tend to look to other places. Uh, when things get bad, you know, we, we, we look elsewhere. But is that what God wants? Does God want us to look elsewhere or does God want us to look to Him? Well, I think the easy answer, answer there is that obviously God wants us to look to Him. So when we read on, and I want you to turn with me to uh, Joshua chapter 24. Now there's, there's some time that takes place. And so give me a, a few minutes just to explain some context here. Now, we're, we're written in to Moses being born. We're written in to Moses fleeing into Midian. We know that uh, Moses becomes a shepherd for an extended period of time. And during that time, God calls Moses because he, he hears the cry of his people, even though they may not have specifically cried out to him for help. He heard their cry. I think that's an important lesson. Even if we're not crying out to God specifically, he hears our pleas, he hears our cries. But, he heard, his, he heard their cries, and God raised up a deliverer for them in Moses. And Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh. And we know that God brought down the plagues, and we know that uh, eventually Pharaoh did let the people of God go. Moses uh, led them out of the land of Egypt across the Red Sea when God parted it miraculously. Uh, they went through the wilderness. God led them from in front and behind and, and protected them through there. Uh, kept them safe, uh, gave them food, gave them water in these harsh conditions. So God protected them while they were there uh, going through the wilderness. And, and as they were going, we read throughout the, the rest of Exodus. We read throughout Leviticus. We read throughout Numbers. And we read throughout De Deuteronomy that they grumbled. The people of God grumbled a lot. And I think Joshua gives us the reason why. Uh, there's also clues littered throughout Leviticus. There's also clues littered throughout Deuteronomy. But I think Joshua, he pretty much just throws it out there and he said, look, here's what's what. And so as, as the, the people of Israel, before we get to Joshua, now remember Joshua is, was a part of that oppression there in Egypt. He came out of this with Moses. And so he went through uh, this oppression with Moses, he saw the miracles of God uh, take place during all this time. He uh, went through the, the wilderness. Remember, Joshua was one of the two people, he and Caleb, who went and spied out the land and said, hey, we can go in there and take it. God, God has already got this planned out. Uh, God's already for us. We can go in there and take it. And then because of 10 other spies, they led the, the people to kind of rebuke that and say, no, we're scared. We can't do that. 
And so God uh, levied a curse on them to wander the uh, wilderness for 40 years until that generation had died out. So Joshua, uh, he was privy to all this. He saw every bit of this taking place. And so think about all the grumbling, all the complaining that, that took place during this time. So after 40 years of wandering around in the wilderness, they finally come back to the promised land. And this time, Joshua and the people, they cross over the Jordan River in a different spot than where they had uh, went the first time to cross into the promised land. And so they cross over into the promised land and, and they, they begin to take over the land. And so as we get to the end of Joshua, we know that Joshua is the successor to Moses. We, we find that out at the end of Deuteronomy, the beginning of Joshua, that Moses... Uh, Moses' successor was Joshua. Joshua was to lead the people uh, into the promised land, and he was to lead them uh, in, in all the things that God wanted his people to do. And so Joshua was faithful. Uh, the, the people who were under Joshua, they were faithful. So as long as Joshua and his people were faithful to God, uh, uh, there were blessings. But I think Joshua says something very important that shows us what was going on during the transition from where there were blessings to oppression for the Israelite people. And I think it's something that, that we need to think about as Christians because I think we fall into this sometimes as well. Now, when we look at what the people were grumbling about, they were grumbling about the comfortable way of life that they had in Egypt. They had fish, they had all, they had, uh, all kinds of vegetables, uh, plants to eat, they had... Uh, they had no shortage of things to eat. It was a buffet of, of whatever they wanted. And they, they were blessed with that. And so uh, they got comfortable there for sure. But there was something else happening. And I see this sometimes happening in, in people's lives and in churches. And it's a, it's a troubling thing where you see a church that was once blessed or a people that was once blessed and... They're not, being, they're, they're not receiving the blessings as much anymore. And I do believe there's a reason for that. It's because those blessings are being choked out. But what I mean by that is turn to Joshua chapter 24. In Joshua chapter 24, now this is very familiar to you. You know this. Uh, you've read this many times. But Joshua gives us a, a very concise answer to what happened during this transition period starting with verse 14 he says now therefore fear the lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in egypt and serve the lord and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the lord choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So Joshua was laying down an ultimatum. And I think that's the same ultimatum that we have today. Now, in, in Joshua's case, he was referring back to the generation that he lived through. All right, so this is firsthand knowledge of what was going on. This is firsthand information of what was happening during this transition. See, the people of God, God used to be the center of their story. God was their life. Something happened. There was a transition where God was no longer the center of their story and their blessings became blocked. What was that? Well, Joshua tells us is the people of Israel, God's people began to worship Egypt's gods. And they also began to worship the gods in which the land that they were currently in, the, the land of the Amorites. And so their blessings became blocked. Now, that, now no, no, there is no question whatsoever that God wanted to bless his people immensely. All throughout the time in the desert, God blessed those people. He blessed them. Their, their clothes never wore out. They were fed. They were watered. And this was a large group. Scholars believe there was a two or more million people wandering through the desert. And that's pretty miraculous. If you've, if you've ever seen uh, video or photos of the area where they were traveling, or if you've uh, ever been there yourself, you know that it's quite a barren landscape. And, 
and, and try, try just to provide for yourself uh, food and water if, if you were out there. Try and think about providing for uh, approximately two million people or more. It was obviously God who did that. So God wanted to bless these people, but they had to wander in the desert for 40 years because their blessings were being choked. God wanted to bless them, but there was something in the way. Something was choking that blessing, and it was their desire for these other gods. See, while in Egypt, jo jo Joshua tells us that they had started worshiping the Egyptian gods. And so this tells us that God was no longer the center of their story, that these Egyptian gods had started to become a more central part of their story. And so when you start leaving God out of your story, you start choking blessings that God wants to pour out on you. And I firmly believe that that's part of what's happening in some of our churches today. See, we're looking for blessings outside of God. See, you know, we might look to say, you know what, maybe this, maybe we're going to get a blessing from this program. Maybe we're going to get a blessing on the way that we do worship, or maybe we're going to get a blessing on how we do this to the building, or maybe we're going to get a blessing here, get a blessing there. But what if we just do the simple thing and put God in the center of our story once again? Because God wants to bless us. The only thing that is choking our blessing are these myriads of things that's blocking it. All these things that we're looking to when we should just be putting God front and center. That's what happened with the Israelite people. God wanted to bless them, but their blessing was choked out by distractions. See, during that transition, they missed so many blessings. God wanted to bless his people. And I firmly believe he's wanting to bless us today. See, there's people crying out. There's people who are oppressed today. Uh, we live in a nation that values life very little. If you look at some of the things that's happened to some of our older folks, our elderly, you look at how uh, the abortion industry is thriving. Uh, and, and right now during this time, it's considered an essential service. Yes, going out and killing the unborn is essential. That's what kind of society we live in. Well, you know what? We're no different than how Egypt was. And there's a lot of churches and a lot of people who call themselves Christians where God is no longer the center of their story. But there's other gods who are the center of their story. And I firmly believe that God is choking those blessings on purpose. You know, and I, I honestly believe that we, we do a great deal of this. We put so many things in the way of, of God's blessings. And, and I want to read you a quote from, uh, from uh, G. Campbell Morgan. He was a great preacher, great evangelist, theologian. Uh, if you ever get a chance to read any of his works, I would highly encourage it. Uh, extremely smart man. Uh, but here's one of the things he said about the Spirit. And as we live in, in the age of the Holy Spirit, the age of the church, if you call yourself a Christian, if you are a Christian saved by the blood of the Lamb, saved under Jesus Christ's precious blood, if, if you are a born-again believer, then you are indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And we can choke blessings. And so I want you, I want you to uh, listen to this quote by G. Campbell Morgan. He said, The difference between a soul that is filled with the Spirit and one that is unfilled is the difference between a well in which there is a spring of water choked and a well from which the obstruction has been removed so that the water springs up and fills the well in every child of god the spirit is present waiting to fill and if he does not fill the whole life to its utmost bound with his own energy light and power it is because there is something that prevents him and which must be removed before he can do his blessed work so if if the christian church is not getting the blessings that we need if we're not getting the blessings that we need individually then perhaps there's something that's choking our well i would encourage you to look today to see what that is because if we're indwelt with the holy spirit then god wants to see it overflowing he wants to see uh this this uh this spring because 
We read in the book of John, we read throughout the Gospels that Jesus is the spring of life. Remember in talking with the woman at the well, he said, I'll give you a water where, uh, to drink that you'll never thirst again. See, that's what he wants to give us. See, see, a lot of times I think people, they misunderstand what blessings are, the blessings that God wants us uh, to have. Too many times I think people misunderstand blessings as wealth, prestige, status, things of that nature. But what if it's just about fulfillment? How many of you feel fulfilled in your life? Whether you have little or whether you have much or anywhere in between, how many of you feel fulfilled in your life? Maybe if you don't, maybe it's because God's not the center of your story anymore. Maybe you're more like the Israelites in, in this transition period as they were under oppression from this other Pharaoh because they had started serving other gods. Their blessings were being choked because God was no longer the center of their story. So I wonder how many of us do that. Maybe, maybe that, that well is blocked by some sort of uh, political ideology. We know that there's plenty of that to go around today. Maybe that's one thing that's choking your blessing. Maybe it's, a, 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 maybe it's a toxic relationship. Uh, maybe that's choking a blessing. Uh, uh, an unequally yoked relationship can also choke a blessing. There's so many different things. Maybe this whole uh, COVID-19 thing. Maybe you're so fearful of what's going on there. God wants to bless you immensely, but you're so scared. You're so caught up and tied up with that, that 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 is now the center of your story and not God. So, so no matter what it is, we have to remove that thing that is choking our blessing because God wants us to be fulfilled in this life. And when we're fulfilled in this life, we can go out and make a difference to other people because there's so many people right now who are oppressed. The, the unborn are being murdered. Uh, 60, 60 some million, I think, uh, since 19... 72 uh, when Roe versus Wade was established. And so effectively, our nation has put to death uh, or murdered 60 million children, the unborn. And now there's legislature all, all over this land and some states who have passed laws where they can actually kill a child after they are born, infanticide. We're going down a road uh, right now in society where we're starting to look just like those uh, uh, those Israelites who no longer had God at the center of their story and were starting to rely on other gods. I don't want us I don't want that to be a part of our story in this generation. I hope that we will wake up and that we will understand what is important and that God has to be the center of our story if we want to be blessed. And again, I want to reiterate this point. Blessings from God don't translate to wealth, prestige, status, or anything like that. It's about fulfilling. It's about being fulfilled in this life, being content with where we are with God's blessings. God will bless us if we allow him. If we take those things that are blocking that well, some people, I'm going to tell you right now, some people's well is dry because it's so blocked up. Church, we need to unblock that well. And let, the, let God's blessings pour out all over our life. Because when that happens, not only are we blessed, but the people around us are blessed. And there's a cry out right now for people who are hopeless, who are looking for something. And we might be that agent of change. We might be that to these people. We, they see us and, we're, and, and they see the life that we have, a life of fulfillment. Not of wealth, not of prestige, not of status not of envy or anything else, but they see that we have a life of fulfillment in Jesus Christ. That might be the very thing that pulls these people out of their life of oppression and bondage. We might just be the catalyst that will help them start to unchoke that well that's so dry in their life. I hope today that if your well is dry or if you know somebody else's well is dry, that you'll start making Christ the center of your story and that you encourage whoever that is that you know to make Christ the center of their story. Because when Christ is not the center of our story, our well will run dry. 
That's the message I have for you today. That's the message that God put on my heart this morning to give to you. I hope and encourage you to make Jesus Christ your everything. Because as G, as G. Campbell Morgan said, if he does not fill the whole life to its utmost bound with his energy, light, and power, it is because there is something which prevents him from doing his work. So let's unblock that thing and let him do his work and bless us with fulfillment in this life. And fulfillment comes through Jesus Christ. And so I encourage you with that today. I hope that there's something in there that you that you got a blessing with, and I hope that you'll go and encourage somebody else today. We're we're in a, a world uh, seems like it's short of encouragement. And if the the spring of life, which is Christ, is welled up in you, is overflowing, you can't keep that to yourself. You need to go out and share that. And so I hope you I hope that you will do that today. Uh, what a beautiful day to be able to do this, be out in uh, God's creation and just hear the birds and uh, the sunshine and this nice weather. Uh, just praise God for that. And I thank you for listening and watching. I hope that you have a wonderfully blessed day. And I, I hope that you will encourage somebody today. And I hope that this word has encouraged you to put Christ at the center of your life. And, uh, and hopefully it will help you uh, take and uh, encourage somebody else to put uh, for them to put Christ in the center of their life. Uh, so that they might find ful ful uh, fulfillment and might be able to go out and praise Jesus Christ today. So as I finish up with that, let me pray for us, and uh, I hope that you'll find a blessing in this. So let us pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for everyone who's listening. And, and Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would bless everyone here, uh, somebody that uh, is here who might be having this problem, Lord, that they maybe they don't have the fulfillment in, in the life that they, they desire. And perhaps there is something choking their well. And so, Lord, I just ask that you would help them find whatever it is that's in their life that's, that's making their well run dry. Help, help them to remove that which it is so that uh, your, your spirit can fully flow through them. And so that their well will, will runneth over, Lord. And so that, they, that that water of life that springs forth from you, Jesus, Lord, would just pour all over their life and into the lives of others that they know and that they love. And uh, and perhaps, Lord, uh, lead us to someone who doesn't know you and, and allow them to see your goodness and your grace and your mercy uh, that you've extended to us and that you're uh, well ready to extend to them. So, Lord, I just ask that uh, uh, you would help us each day to be more like you and to, to lead people to you and just be able to share the good news and, and show people that you are, the, you are the, 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 the spring of life and Lord, that uh, if we if we drink from Your water, we drink from Your well, Lord. We know that uh, we'll never thirst. We'll never we'll uh, we'll never be able to quench that thirst, Lord, because uh, Lord, You just You fill us so much, and uh, Lord, we just thank You for it, and we thank You that You are in our life, and that You love us so much that You came and died for us. So, Lord, I just pray for everyone who uh, is listening today, and Lord, that You would put a blessing upon them. And I pray all of these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So I thank you for listening today. I hope you have a wonderfully blessed day. I hope you enjoy this beautiful day and this beautiful weather that we're having. And God bless, and we'll see you again next time.